the, top, the topic today is OER textbooks and digital tools. And uh, my name is Ruth Guthrie. I'm from Cal Poly Pomona, and I'm on the CA OER Council. And I'm an OER adopter uh, myself in a huge course at Cal Poly Pomona that you'll, I'll probably brag about today. Um, so the topic today coincides with the kickoff of toolkit number two on the uh, Council we on the Cool for Ed website, and it's about working with OER textbooks and materials. And as a way to talk about OER textbooks, I thought we'd use the famous five R's of OER. And the first one is actually retain, and reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And people have suggested that accessibility is the sixth R, that people need to talk about accessibility also when they talk about OER textbooks. And then we'll talk about learning strategies and digital reading uh, and digital textbooks. But before we get into that, I'd like to talk about institutional support, because a lot of things that I could tell you might be different at my university than they are at yours. So the library, of course, is a huge support for finding OER materials. They can help with people understand copyright. A lot of faculty don't know about Creative Commons and CC BY or CC BY share alike. They don't know what those things mean. And a librarian who knows about copyright can explain that very, very easily. And they're all, librarians are also great with uh, hard copies of textbooks. And I ran into the librarian at our school last week, and I was talking about what a great thing it would be, just buy a bunch of copies of this architecture book, and then the students can check them out, and they can reuse it, check it in, and uh, they only have to buy so many copies, and you save all that money. No digital book involved. And the librarian said, I just had a faculty member do that. They got a grant, and they bought all these books, and they didn't tell me about it, and I didn't have any space to put the books. But they, they worked it out, and they found space for the books. But the library, incredible. Uh, ally for OER. IT, it uh, information technology and support services, can help with uh, technology um, networking in the classroom, Wi-Fi. And then if students have problems uh, accessing a digital book, sometimes universities have a help desk, and the students can go there and get help and figure out how to do something. E-learning, I know it's some universities, e-learning is central to using OER and to redesigning courses with um, free and low-cost materials. And so that might be a very good place to get help when you're adopting an OER text and trying to find different materials to supplement it. Uh, and then disabled student services, because access, of course, is a huge question, and they're always there to make sure that the materials comply. And then I dedicated a whole slide to the bookstore because I learned so much from the bookstore during my own OER adoption. And people really misperceive the bookstore. And a lot of students feel like, oh, the bookstore is a big ripoff. And even faculty, I even reviewed a course. And in the faculty syllabus, it said something about the bookstore being a ripoff. But really, that's not the case. The bookstore is there to help. And they can do that in many ways. And th this is just five of the things that our bookstore does. There's things they do beyond this, providing print copies of OER textbooks. So they'll get copies printed. And for my own course, 100 copies of the book were printed, and they all sold out. But for the book, a printed copy of the book, it was $15 to a student. And many of them preferred a printed copy. Uh, posting links to OER textbooks on the bookstore website really useful, because when a student goes in and they're picking their books for the term, they can pick an OER book and uh, get a printed copy. Offering real-time price comparison. Most bookstores show the students, this is what it is on Amazon, this is what it is from <coughs> the publisher, pardon me, and this is what it is from, uh, from another source, like uh, what's the I'm sorry, I need a drink of water. Hold on a, just a second. Uh, 
I'm back. <laughs> I wish we could edit that part out, Teresa, but I guess we can't. I, I think it's the spring weather and my nose is running and I'm having trouble uh, not coughing. Uh, back to the bookstore. Providing rental options of textbooks, of course, and then uh, many faculty, their way to support students and lower costs is to adopt an old version of the text and the bookstore allows, will find older editions and sell those at a reduced price to students. Also a very useful strategy for saving money. All right, back to the four R's that we're discussing today. Reuse. Reuse means you're reusing the book and uh, that could be an entire text adoption and uh, I'd encourage you to think about what support materials come with the book, um, like test banks, and uh, PowerPoint presentations. The study done by the Council of people who adopted OER and we studied them in the classroom and found what worked for them and what didn't. And they really loved the OER textbooks, but the books that came without support materials, faculty spent a great deal of time developing those materials. And uh, uh, it's a lot easier to do an adoption if you have those support materials built in. There's also faculty that use a lot of sources from other um, places like multimedia sources or original sources or sources that they've got from their teaching and their own sources that, that they complement the book with and I'll, um, or, or they don't use a book. And the example I've got is from San Marcos and I'll have to make that correction with the, it's not San Marcos, San Marcos and their COM program and they have a program to reduce costs where faculty really do a, an entire course redesign and uh, I was at their OER week uh, about a month ago and Jonathan Berman is a professor who teaches VSAR 422 Art and Technology of the Moving, Moving Image and he said the previous book was like reading a phone book and it was very factual and went through lots of movies and students found it very boring to read and it was a very expensive book too and he took the time to find his own sources and find original sources that were free and compiled them in a learning management system and then provided it to the st students for free. So it became a bookless course that was a compil compilation of other materials. There's also faculty that are reluctant to adopt OER. And while this isn't a cost savings, at least it gets OER into the door and into the classroom. So they'll use the traditional textbook and then supplement it with an OER text. And th that way, if students can't afford the traditional text, they can use the OER text, or maybe the faculty develops a trust with the OER text and then adopts it later. Revise. The a big benefit of OER textbooks is that you can revise them. You can change them to fit your course. So the idea is to adopt, modify, improve, and then possibly share. The copyright license on OER textbook is often CC BY, and that means you can do anything you want with it. You can, you could even sell it. You, you have to check the copyright, but if it's just CC BY, you could repackage the book, put public domain pictures in it, and sell it if you wanted. The copyright's so open. Uh, more practically, you could reorder the chapters, so if a, if a course has a specific order that you like to go in, you don't have to follow the order of the textbook that you're using. You can change the chapters around to fit your needs. But I would think about page numbering if you're going to do that because uh, things get messed up and students need to be able to track what part of the book you're talking about. And then I'd also think about breaking the book into smaller pieces because downloading an entire book is sometimes uh, uh, difficult for students and they'd much rather download the book in smaller pieces, particularly if they're using a tablet or a phone device. And then the nice thing about uh, revision too is you can integrate other things like multimedia videos, YouTube videos, things that are appropriate depending on what uh, topic you're teaching. 
and then remix. This is kind of a favorite R of mine, though not a lot of people do this. But if you had a book that met some of your needs and another book that met other needs, you could take different chapters and just pull your own book together uh, to build a quality text, hopefully. But not a lot of people have done this yet. Um, you can also find the content from a different source. Uh, as long as the copyright's okay. And so the only example I have is ChemWiki. ChemWiki is out of UC Davis, and it's one of the most famous OER examples that we've got. And with ChemWiki, it's a wiki-style book on all the topics in chemistry, and they'll even remix it so that it's a version of the text for different universities. Different universities have requested that they have a text that's like this, and ChemWiki provided it. But it does give you a hierarchical breakdown that you could sort of create your own textbook from the different materials available in ChemWiki. Uh, Ranjita Basu, again a calm faculty member, teaches Econ 441, which I believe, I, I, sorry I didn't write the course number down, I think it's, or the course name, it's International Trade. And a lot of the students um, commented to her that they liked her lectures more than the textbook because they uh, felt like they got more out of the lectures. So she tried to go bookless and then the students said, no, we need a book to complement it because we can't really follow along. And then she did a mixing of an OER textbook with her materials and online lectures that she created and built the course um, from that. But starting from an existing text, I think, is a lot easier than just building your own OER textbook, taking something that exists and adding materials to it. Redistribute. Uh, once you've created your OER, part of the beauty of open source and sharing is that you can uh, redistribute your book and share it with the community. And Merlot is a great place for that. Clearly, people have contributed lots and lots of sources and uh, shared them with the world. Uh, another place to find out about great OER materials are discipline-specific conferences. And OER is really growing in popularity. And if you go to an educational conference in a specific discipline, chances are you'll find out about some re free resource that uh, you can use in the classroom. Uh, and of course, post it on the web. And I haven't talked about my own course now, so maybe here's a good chance for me. We adopted a free book, and we're adding three chapters to it. And uh, we built PowerPoint slides, we built a glossary, we built a quizzing system, and we built a test bank, which we're not sharing. But all of the other things we are sharing. And since the course resides in a learning management system, that is closed to the world which doesn't share anything. So we've developed a website, and it's got all the materials on it for anyone to use, including students, and self-quizzes for students to use, and things like that. And once we posted that website, the author of the, our textbook contacted us and said, hey, can I use your materials? To which we said, of course you can. And we've gotten inquiries from other universities also to use the supplements that we built for this textbook. So that's uh, been a big, uh, success story. Uh, feedback to original authors in our study that we did of people using OER in the classroom. A person reported that they really wished the book had a little more content on this. And the author could tell from their downloads that this person was using the book and emailed and asked, what do you think of it? How's it going? And she indicated, I really need more material on this. And she said before the end of the term, the person who created the textbook had had created that material and sent it to her so that she could use it. But I'm, I'm sure that was uh, some luck also, some luck and some motivation. Um, but for OER to be sustainable, there needs to be that conversation and that feedback and that sharing. Because uh, it's uh, like ChemWiki, for a lot of people, it, it makes a, it's a little work for a lot of people. And you can bring it together and make something that can be really high quality and then, of course, save students a lot of money. All right, now let's shift gears a little and talk about digital reading. In toolkit number two, there's four articles that talk about digital reading and how reading is uh, changing for students and how um, 
It's not like pay, playing Mario Kart. It's a different kind of thing. And it's tough because students often think of uh, a computer and an electronic device as for entertainment. And when it's for reading, you can't read it like, a, like an entertainment device. You don't use it the same way. So let me talk first about the downside of e-readers or electronic devices. Eye strain, of course. If you're sitting and staring at an electronic device for too long, your eyes can get tired, you can get headaches, and there are studies that show if you're too long on electronic devices, it'll interrupt your sleep patterns. Uh, though maybe that's changing because everybody gets their Netflix and falls asleep watching uh, Breaking Bad or something, maybe. Um, the amount of time students spend reading online is not that much. And what's meant by that is that when students say, oh, I'm going to read this book online, they look at the computer, their laptop, or a tablet, but they're also getting uh, text messages from their friends, getting a notification that they've got an email, or they might say, oh, I need a break and go watch the cat videos on YouTube or something. It's not very easy to focus if they're used to a device that is very much them going around to different places. Concentrating on reading may be very, very difficult. Uh, also, if they're going to spend a ton of time reading, if it's a very long text or a whole book that they're reading, it might be hard for them to focus online, and it might be better for them to have a hard copy. So strategies, of course, that directly follow from this are reduce your distractions, turn off your notifications, turn off your phone, and make sure you can focus on the task at hand. And then students should know it might take practice to get used to reading online and searching and navigating. If, and if there's a text that has a proprietary reader that's a specific format, the first time they use it, it's going to be a little difficult to figure out how to search and how to navigate and how to launch the book and things like that. But the second or third time they use it, it will be much, much easier. And so to not be frustrated after the first time, but to stick with it until they become accustomed to it. And then I'd encourage people not to read a digital book like they read a website. There's a bunch of studies on how people read the web, and they read it in an F pattern across the screen. So whatever's in the upper left-hand corner is the first thing they'll see and the most. And then the rest of the screen, when you get down to the bottom right, nothing's read. But reading a textbook online is not like reading a website, and you do have to focus and read the full page, not not like you would sk skimming around like you were reading an e-commerce website. And then studying is different from reading. If someone's reading a book, that's quite different from doing a set of math problems where you'll need paper and you might need your sources around you in a way that's productive for you. So for reading, you might sit back in a chair. You might have comfortable lighting in the room. For doing your math homework, you would sit up in the chair and you'd have direct lighting on your page so you could get all your formulas correct. Maybe. For a, a college student, maybe not. All right. So a, a colleague of mine, Diego Bonilla, created a t tutorial on reading elect on electronic devices. And it's listed here, the different uh, breakouts of what's in his tutorial. And it's all uh, video online. And it's, he's put a lot of thought and effort into the different uh, topics in reading on electronic devices. And that's part of toolkit number two also. So I'd encourage you to look at that. And a big thing that students commented on in our focus groups last summer was, I can't annotate a digital book. I can't annotate a PDF. Um, and things about uh, the size of the text, too, not being able to manipulate the size of the text. But actually, you can annotate uh, digital text. And there's lots, most of them come with annotation devices. And PDF certainly does. If you go to YouTube and you look for annotate a PDF, you will find 50 tutorials about how to do that kind of task. But it's still not as easy as sitting with a text and writing on the side or underlining things. But you can still do it. If you're on a mobile device, it is very difficult to do because of the small screen size and because selecting text is a multi-stage process. It's not just writing a line. 
Uh, if the book requires constant internet access, that might be a problem for annotation. And if the book is a website-based book, like if the book was ChemWiki, it would be impossible to annotate because those are static pages that are on a website and you're not allowed to mark those up. So um, annotation could still be a challenge. And printing, uh, self-printing. Students that uh, we spoke to really loved the freedom to print anything they wanted from the book and to not feel like they had to violate a copyright law to do so. Uh, you might think about if the text is in color, uh, providing a non-color option that's still clear because sometimes when you print something like a biology book where maybe there's a diagram that uh, has color and is very detailed, a printed copy on a student laser printer will not come out as clearly as the one you see digitally. The bookstore and library often can do uh, printing for you. Like I said, my bookstore, it's a 200-page book and they provided it to students for $15. Um, and then print-on-demand services, you can find those online and uh, that's a possibility too. And then uh, you're probably familiar with the publisher OpenStax. That's probably the leading OER publisher on the planet. And they've got uh, PDF copies for free. And then if you want a hardbound copy that looks like a traditional textbook, you can get their books for anywhere from uh, 35 to $50. Very, very reasonable price for a very robust book. Uh, Great. And my two notes, a black and white copy might not look as good as a online copy. And the textbook that I've adopted for my course, Management Information Systems, the print, the, in the online copy, the key terms are all italicized and it looks very clear what a key term is. In the printed copy, it's a lot harder to pick that out with your eyes, what the key terms are, than it is in the in the electronic copy. So you might look for things like that on when the printed copy doesn't do as well. Uh, and then if it's, again, if it's a web-based book and it's available on several pages, printing that is very, very difficult. So, so my strategy for that, if that ever happens to me, is I'm going to write the person who owns the website and say, hey, this would be easier if you had one PDF. You guys should think about doing that and see if they'll do the work for me but I doubt it. <laughs> so the bottom line, as a student, a student needs to think about what they need to do with the text. What kind of activity are they doing? Is it skimming? Is it reading? Is it studying for a test? Or is it studying and doing their homework? Very different things. And then they can try different things out and adopt what works for them. One student might do really, really well on a laptop, and another student might do much, much better with a printed copy, but it's an individual thing. Uh, but I'd keep in mind that we're already well into the age of digital readers and uh, Amazon Kindle is a great example of how many people have really moved to reading digital texts and uh, our students grew up in a time where they have lots of digital sources for many things so they should be really well suited to do this. All right, do you have any questions or concerns? Or are you still there? How's it going at West Hills? Yeah. How are your proposals going on campus? I'll share with you how we're doing at Cal Poly Pomona before we end it. Um, you know, our um, campus savings program, our ALI program, is really focused on uh, 
the library and not so much on free textbooks. And our campus is converting to semesters in 2018. And it's a really hard time to sell people on OER text adoption or sell departments. Now I'm going to go to individual people and see if I can talk them into it. But I, I don't think Cal Poly Pomona will be submitting a proposal because we're having a really difficult time getting individuals interested in it. The whole campus supports affordable learning, but finding the time to go through a textbook review and adoption is a hard sell so far. Uh, Linda, Linda said, we are focusing on ALS right now, but we have an OER faculty member ready to apply. And then that's great. Our Oxford said, that's my approach. We are small for individual conversations. And then Linda said, we have a large Ken 200 202 class that wants to use an open stack book. That sounds really good because it's uh, I assume multiple sections. Wow, 30 sections. That's fantastic. And the OpenStax books come with the uh, test bank and slides. It comes with a fully supported textbook. I do have a question I want to ask um, uh -huh. out loud. Um, are, can we consider most of the things in open stacks to be accessible? Or I'm just wondering um, how much how much of the material in there is considered accessible and that we would have to run it through our student disability services? Or can we pretty much uh, trust what's in there? You know, um, I know that the chancellor's office is doing a study of accessibility of the textbooks, but I actually had a student worker in the summer, and I took five of the most popular books, and one of them was an OpenStax book, and, and uh, ran them through an accessibility checker. And there were very, very few issues. And the issues that did come up were um, a picture didn't have alternative text. They were very simple things to fix. So I think you're probably pretty good with OpenStax, because it, it's a PDF. And they've taken the care to make sure the headings and the subheadings are nested properly, and that things have alternative text. I think um, there would be very few issues with that. But, but I'm not the last word. The chancellor's office is going to um, show their report, and uh, then uh, um, your your own disability student center would have to look at it. But I would add also, the textbooks you're getting from a publisher are certainly not any better than an OER textbook. And, and I'll add another thing. Sorry, I can't seem to stop talking. Uh, websites, in the study we did of faculty adopting OER, the faculty that used websites um, as the, a textbook website, most of those were not accessible. And the biggest thing was it had embedded video that didn't have captioning, or it had pictures without alternative text and things like that. But it would be a lot to get captioning for those videos, especially if they're from YouTube and the captioning hasn't been done properly. There's no way that's going to, that would be a, a tough hurdle to, to pass. OK? Thank you, guys. Good luck with your OER efforts. Bye. Thanks, Ruth.